thank you all so much for coming. So we're uh, a group of students in, um, we're from the po uh, political science and environmental studies 384 class here at the UW, which is a um, global environmental politics class. And so for part of our class project, we were working with For the People and with Derek and um, towards the goal of eventually um, addressing the five oil refineries that are in Washington state and hopefully creating a feasible plan for an off-ramp to close down at least two of those refineries by 2030. So my name is Luna. My name is Tia. I'm Jordan. I'm Logan. And I'm Lauren. And so today we're all going to be presenting about some of the issues that uh, are going on with these refineries, why they should be shut down. We're also going to be talking about uh, previous cases in which refineries were shut down and with, in which alternatives were created uh, for energy that were cleaner, more humane, more just. Uh, and then we'll also talk a bit about our own plan. And so, yeah. Uh, before we start, we'd like to do a land acknowledgement just to uh, be aware of the land we're on and its connection to the Duwamish. So we acknowledge that we're presenting in the University of Washington, which is sitting on the traditional land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish. Furthermore, we are acknowledging that Seattle came to be owned by the United States in the Treaty of Point Elliot in 1855. This treaty has not been honored and it's, um, the conditions of it have frequently been violated in a way that has been unfair to the Duwamish particularly the reservation that was promised to them still has yet to be created. And so for that reason, we argue uh, in the hopes of establishing indigenous sovereignty and supporting it, we're at, we advocate for the legal return of this land to the Duwamish. I'll now pass it on to Tia. Hello. So I'm gonna start off uh, discussing why this issue is important. So starting off with Washington state's climate goals that the government has been um, set up. So the Washington state legislature has a target to reduce carbon emissions at least 25% below 1990 levels by 2035. Although the Department of Ecology has recommended a target of 40% below 1990 levels by 2035 to, and that's to reduce um, the major effects of climate change on Washington state, coastlines, water supplies, forests, environment, and economy. Um, so those, our goal is ambitious compared to other states within the United States, yet it's not ambitious enough, and we need to address that. Um, so in addition to those emissions reduction goals, Washington has also set a target to have carbon neutral electricity by 2030 and 100% clean electricity by 2045. And so that relates directly to uh, shutting down these oil refineries. And by not acting now, we are simply procrastinating the inevitable shift to clean energy um, and continuing to degrade our communities and the environment. So here we have kind of an emissions timeline um, that was set up by the Washington state government. And so in 2018, which was the last uh, data set that was collected on carbon emissions in Washington, there were 99.6 million metric tons of CO2 emitted annually. So by 2030, the goal is to have that to be all the way down to 50 million metric tons. Uh, and then 2035 was that target that I had mentioned before of 25% below 1990 levels. 2040, we wanna be at 27 million metric tons of CO2. And then by 2050, 5 million metric tons of CO2 and offset all remaining emissions. So we're going to need to do, take some drastic action to meet these targets. And so this large number is the approximate uh, tons of CO2 emissions produced annually from Washington State's oil refineries. So this is a huge chunk of carbon emissions that we're definitely going to need to decrease. And it's also a great opportunity for us to help the environment and mitigate climate change. So Washington State's history as a source for refined oil begins in 1953, when Shell made the decision to build a new refinery in Anacortes. This was the first oil refinery built in Washington State. By 1958, 
This refinery was one out of four major refineries that were operating in the state, alongside the Texaco refinery, also in Anacortes. Today, it's called the Marathon Refinery. The Ferndale Refinery, which is owned by Phillips 66, and the U.S. Oil Refinery in Tacoma, which today is owned by Par Pacific. These would be joined by several smaller, less successful refineries, which all would eventually close down, before eventually being joined by the Cherry Point Refinery in Blaine, Washington in 1971, which today is operated by British Petroleum. With easy access to crude oil from Alaska through tankers, and easy access to tar sands crude oil from Alberta with the Trans Mountain Pipeline, the various Puget Sound oil refineries continually grow their capacity for refining in order to fit growing regional demand. In 1958, with just the four oil refineries, we saw that, the four ex we saw that those four refineries produce about 140,000 barrels of oil daily altogether. In 1980, by, by that time, we not only had the Cherry Point oil refinery added in, but each of these refineries was also working to drastically increase its production. So we had 368. And by 2019, which was the last time a measure was taken, we've had 652,000 of barrel produced, uh, barons, barrels of oil produced daily. And so what we're seeing here is radical expansion just in order to meet the demands of the region and to continue to produce. So why do the refineries need to grow? As we can see, there's a lot of expansionism. And this expansionist trend is representing the core of all the problems with not just these oil refineries, but oil refineries in general. Although we can anticipate some changes in the way that these refineries function as the world supply of crude oil begins to diminish, the current trend is one of growth for the same reasons that all businesses are seeking to grow. The interest of these oil production companies is in making money so that they can reinvest it into uh, creating greater, uh, a greater volume of their product, making it more valuable to their customers, and in some cases, even making it less environmentally damaging. However, the, envir the reduction in environmental damage that comes as a result of changes in their production process uh, is offset by the environmental damage that is required by this growth. And so, uh, so as they grow more, they'll continue to consume land and resources, even if they begin to diminish that through different, uh, less wasteful processes, it really won't do a ton to diminish that uh, land and re that growing need for land and resources. This, of course, is not to mention the inherent uh, competition in the oil market, which requires that all competing oil uh, uh, companies grow. And it also does not account for the growth required by crises, such as the restriction on Russian crude oil that has been created with the invasion of Ukraine. All of these factors require the enduring growth of the oil industry, oil refineries, and they require the growth of the impacts that these, uh, that these refineries have. These impacts, of course, do not affect all people equally, but they're instead rooted in Washington states and the wider US's centuries-long history of colonialism. We can first talk about the injustices that secured the land that these refineries lie on now, and that allows them to even exist. The land in the South Puget Sound, which the US oil refinery is built on, was ceded to the United States in 1854 with the Treaty of Medicine Creek. This land would be ceded on the condition that the nine Indian tribes which signed on to this treaty would be guaranteed cash payment, would be given access to three different reservations that they could continue to live on, and would be allowed fishing and hunting rights that were still consistent with their traditional ways of living. The other four refineries were built on land ceded in the uh, Treaty of Point Elliot in 1855. Although it wasn't until 100 years later that oil refineries were built on this land, they, these treaties have been at the center of discussions for how the oil refineries violate those treaties. One significant example is the dispute by the Swinomish over the rights to March Point. That's where the Marathon and, uh, and the Shell refineries are built, and it's sort of where we're seeing the greatest amount of environmental damage. So as you can see here, we have this map and it's been updated to reflect our a more accurate geographical knowledge uh, in the modern day. But this map was widely disseminated both through the 
tribes involved in the Treaty of Point Elliot and in the Office of Indian Affairs, which um, with which the treaty was signed. And as you can see, it clearly designates March Point as part of the Swinomish Reservation. However, due to an ex executive order by President Grant in 1873, uh, the new boundaries were drawn, which excluded March Point from the Swinomish Reservation, which we can see here and which we can see in the modern day. Uh, oh, here, I'll outline those on the slide. And which we can see in the modern day boundaries of that reservation. A more recent example of the ways that these treaties have been violated is in the attempt to build the Gateway Pacific Terminal at Cherry Point in Blaine. Fortunately, this was rejected by the Army Corps of Engineers in 2016, specifically because it violated the Lumi Nation's, Nation's right to fish in a way that was traditional to them. It also led to the prohibition by the Whatcom County Council of new construction of new refineries, fossil fuel shipment facilities, or coal plants. This is fortunate, but it points to the continuing necessity of curtailing the growth of these industries, as well as the way that indigenous rights and indigenous sovereignty uh, standpoint can support that. However, the issue that is posed by these oil refineries goes far beyond just the way that they uh, take land. Maintaining the Puget Sound oil refineries has had the consequence of unfairly and fundamentally altering the way of life for indigenous people living near them. As a group, we had the privilege of meeting with a Swinomish tribal member who described some of the impacts that the two March Point oil refineries had on their community. The obvious example of this is the ways in which the presence of the two refineries has affected and contaminated the air and water near the Swinomish re re reservation. Industrial development in the area, which is largely dominated by these two refineries, has taken over the waterways that the Swinomish people have lived around for centuries and that they have gathered their resources. Fish and clams that used to be the source of food are now contaminated. Furthermore, uh, there has been no indication by, given by these refineries that these resources are contaminated. And so what ends up happening is tourists come and they try to dig up clams not knowing they're contaminated. And um, this is just generally an issue of these oil refineries not accurately representing the way in which they cause damage. Not only is it unsafe, but it's been central to the conversation of how these refineries have violated these treaties. By contaminating the fishing and water supply and making them un unfit for human consumption, they're curtailing the rights of the swimmers that have been guaranteed by the Treaty of Point Elliot to continue fishing. The other significant impact that these uh, refineries have had on the lives of Swinomish has been their relationship with their cultural practices. So the two March Point refineries, here we can see the Shell refinery, have both, uh, have both started dominating the skyline. They not only take up a huge amount of land on the ground, but they're spewing chemicals into the air that really make it just an unpleasant and somewhat uh, depressing place to live for the people who uh, have existed there as a community for centuries. Furthermore, the light, uh, the light pollution produced by these refineries has made it impossible for the Swinomish to participate in ceremonies that would typically take place at night, unless they're willing to move further and further away from their community to continue to participate in those. So this is all an issue of, we can connect this to the issue of environmental racism. Typically, environmental racism can be understood, and this is drastically oversimplifying, to be either when areas that are predominantly peopled by people of color or people of lower socioeconomic status, these are the areas that are selected for industrial development. It can also occur when an area that's selected for industrial development has its property values decreased and is made such an unpleasant place to live to the point that only the poorest people who are unable to afford to live anywhere else are the ones still living in it. This takes on a new aspect when you consider the, uh, when you consider the issue of indigenous land, by, uh, of indigenous sovereignty. These are communities that have, been, that have existed for centuries and that have built their entire way of life around the place that they're living in. Uh, not only is it unfair then for them to uh, for them to have to change that, but it also creates a, a wild adjustment for them that not everyone is able to adjust to. Mm. The fight for indigenous land rights in this way takes on many angles, 
in how it uh, in how it affects people's rights to live on land that should rightfully be theirs, on how it keeps them from their food, on how it uh, brings health issues to them. And so we can see that it also is strongly affected by the need to fight against these refineries, as well as the fact that the fight for these refineries needs to be done uh, on the with the perspective of defending indigenous sovereignty. So now I'll pass the mic on to Jordan to talk more specifically about the impact these refineries have had on communities around them. <clears throat> yep, so let's talk about how these uh, five oil refineries have impacted communities around them. Um, so first, uh, these are a few facts uh, that come from the Sightline Institute uh, that talk about how uh, these oil refineries have impacted the community. So the five refineries in Washington account for four of the top eight sources of carbon pollution in the state. Um, these oil refineries are major sources of toxic air pollutants, um, including these, these um, <clears throat> uh, pollutants there. Um, studies show that people living within 10 miles of each of these refineries are at higher risk of developing <clears throat> a wide range of health issues, including asthma, cancers, neurological and cardiovascular damage, as well as blood disorders. Multiple corporations in the past couple of decades have been issued fines for failing to follow these clean air regulations and tracing dangerous fumes. Sorry, I need my glasses. Um, even after treating these wastewaters, or after treating the wastewater, there have been uh, many pollutants that still remain uh, in water, including drinking water and other waters that um, humans use every day as well as affected the uh, spawn count that has been tracked from the past 40 years, 1973 through 2012. Um, so I want everyone to take a minute and maybe think about how, um, what impacts have you seen in your own communities from the oil industry? Um, my name is Sylvia, um, I'm from Seattle, and I um, have noticed, it's not exactly oil refineries, but like the environmental racism, like when I used to live in Utah when I was a kid, my mom had really bad asthma. And then when we moved to um, Shoreline, her asthma just disappeared. Mm -hmm. And so when I was in university, I did some studies around the air quality there <clears throat> and found out that they chose to put the flight paths to SeaTac right over from Utah. Mm -hmm. And so it causes a lot of pollution in the air. So um, it's not exactly about oil industry, but it's kind of similar, I guess, because planes eat oil. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just like building on what you were saying around the choice to impact um, neighborhoods where people of marginalized races live. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. Well, Sy Sylvia was just sharing about um, her experience in Beacon Hill um, about how it wasn't necessarily about oil refineries, but when she lived, lived in Beacon Hill, she noticed that um, the flight paths of SeaTac Airport and the planes were flying over her neighborhood and um, her mother had very bad asthma. But um, when she moved uh, away to Shoreline, she noticed that um, her mother's asthma had left. So that's just another example of, you know, oil impacts around and how it affects marginalized neighborhoods. But I'll move on if there's nothing else. Okay. All right, so let's talk about environmental health disparities, um, kind of, you know, building on some of this point. Um, University of Washington developed an interactive map known as the Washington Environmental Health Disparities Map that ranked the risk of uh, each neighborhood in Washington uh, that faces environmental factors that influence health outcomes. <clears throat> Here are a couple of findings. Um, individuals with pre-existing heart diseases are at higher risk to mortality when exposed to environmental stressors. Children who have a low birth weight or at risk of developing other health morbidities when exposed to air pollution and pesticides. In terms of socioeconomic factors, low educational attainment, housing burden, linguistic isolation, poverty, people of color, and unemployment communities all have a high risk of poor health due to a disparity of healthcare access, making them uh, at higher risk and more vulnerable to so, environmental risk factors. So, you know, kind of butting out what you were saying, people that are, you know, um you know marginalized and you know don't have great access to health care um they're you know more risk because of these um environmental factors from the oil refineries <clears throat> so here i'm going to talk about a couple different refineries 
Uh, first, I'm going to talk about the Tacoma oil refinery. This one, you know, kind of means a lot to me because I, I'm I'm from Tacoma, uh, South Tacoma. So, you know, some of these, uh, you know, this has a great effect on my community. Um, so while it wasn't, I misspoke here, while it wasn't built uh, in 1952, the it was founded in 1952 and the plan to start to build, you know, started from there. Um, so some quick facts about this refinery. Uh, they produce, produce around 42,000 barrels of oil per day. Uh, they have a storage capacity of 2.9 million barrels uh, in their facilities. Um, and they use 14 miles of pipelines to transport their oil around Western Canada and the Pacific Northwest. So uh, during my research, I was able to come across um, a City of Tacoma Planning Commission meeting uh, that discussed uh, the regulations of the tide flats and industrial land use um, in Tacoma. So some of the various comments were posted by residents that and with, they were talking about how it had affected them. So, you know, a couple of these comments um, talked about how the interim regulations halting the process of new or building new high risk facilities in this area um needed to be amended to prevent expansion of existing facilities um they weren't really being enforced um as we can see in the next point it calls for tougher regulations in south tacoma um because it there or sorry on industrial zoning districts as they're in close proximity to a lot of residential homes uh, i can say for myself um and there's many businesses schools and other you know community uh, aspects um, and then they wanted to stop oil line expansion. Um, as someone said that the, the uh, oil line expansion uh, was the zoning permits were not really being enforced. Um, so it was infringed on their 70 some odd year um, home. And, you know, they're worried about losing that and they just want stricter regulations behind that. Um, and then I'll briefly graze upon this point because it was, um, you know, kind of addressed earlier, but. These are the two um, points or two oil refineries in Whatcom County. So first we have Cherry Point. They process about 250,000 barrels of oil per day. Um, they're the largest supplier of jet fuel in the Pacific Northwest, Seattle, uh, Canada, and uh, Portland. Um, and it's the largest refinery in Washington State. So then we have the Ferndale one uh, ran by Phillips 66, produces around 121,000 barrels per day. Uh, they produce oil mainly to support marine transportation, and um, they transport their oil via pipeline, ship, and rail car. So as briefly spoke about before, um, Whatcom County had a big milestone um, ordinance. So in 2021, they became the first county in the United States to ban new fossil fuel infrastructure. You know, the ban includes the construction of new refineries, coal-fired power plants, and other related infrastructure. Um, this one also, you know, placed restrictions on the existing fossil fuel facilities uh, in Whatcom County, uh, requiring these facilities to offset planet heating gases that were emitted from the previous expansion. So, yeah, uh, this this um, ordinance came from years long fight uh, I spoke about before as well. So in 2016, uh, they, they tried to build the largest coal port ever in North America at in uh, Cherry Point. It would have you know, emitted around 50 million tons of coal per year, uh, but the illumination fought against it, um, you know, saying that it would have infringed upon their uh, tr treaty protected fishing rights. Um, it would have killed the tribe's crab fisheries and prevent them from uh, rebuilding the herring run that they've lost because of these refineries already. They're also worried about the surrounding communities because they foresaw that it would disturb not only environmental habitats, but, um, you know, some of their oldest and longest running villages. And then I'll pass it off to Logan. And just there's a comment in the chat. Oh, if you to be oh. yeah, sure. Railroaded oil tankers risk derailment, fire, explosion, and leaks around and into Idaho's largest lake, Pend or Oriel, uh, the fifth deepest lake in the U.S. Only 10 to 20 percent of oil spills can be recovered from uh, large turbulent water bodies. Uh, thank you, Helen. So now my, my big question was, have other communities done this? Have NGOs or community organizations been instrumental in the fight to create just transitions away from large uh, petrochemical uh, refining projects 
and to something else. And the uh, key example that I found was uh, in Philadelphia with the PES oil refinery and their fight to uh, create a just transition there. Um, so it's like, who has, who's done this? Uh, how did they do it? And what can we learn and take away from their experiences? Uh, so the key organization here was the Philly Thrive organization in Philadelphia. Uh, they were founded in 2015 and they worked very hard towards shuttering what was the oldest and largest oil refinery on the East Coast, the PES oil refinery in Philadelphia. They've also aimed to assist in the just transition that is ongoing since its closure in 2019. Um, I do stress again that this is an ongoing thing and has been impacted by uh, COVID-19. So I don't know all the details of what's going on there, but it is very exciting to look towards what's going on and take, take uh, experience from that. So they managed to assist in the shuttering of the PES refineries. How did they do that? Um, so the refinery had multiple fires um, and it was eventually put up for sale. Um, the buyer, or the, uh, the prospective buyer at the time, uh, specialized in transitioning refineries into other spaces. Um, but the Trump administration tried to block that sale, trying to maintain the level of oil refining that the PES oil refinery could put out. Philly Thrive was instrumental in protesting um, in order to permit the sale to go through as planned. Um, unfortunately, but importantly for our purposes, it's not a. It's not something that was initiated by Philly Thrive. They weren't. They weren't the ones who initiated the process of this. But they set up the groundwork to make it happen, and they assisted in making it happen. They saw an opportunity, and they took it. So then we have the aftermath. What happens now that the PES oil refinery is no longer an oil refinery? Questions remain about what will become of the community, the workers, and the infrastructure of the refinery. Philly Thrive has its work cut out for it in the aftermath, but it's well positioned to make better, to make the world better in their community. Um, aspects of that will include transitions to the workers, uh, repurposing or decommissioning infrastructure in order to, to reutilize that space, as well as finding energy sources that are not connected to the oil refinery itself. Um, Philly Thrive has, of course, positioned itself well to help with that, and that work is ongoing. So then the question is, it, is this applicable? There have been accidents in, um, in Washington State oil refineries, very sadly. Um, but some of these were, were decades ago, and there's not really a lot of, it's not really current. And sales of, say, the March Point and Tacoma plants have gone through, um, but they've been to other petrochemical, petrochemical companies and not to other businesses that would aim to transition away from it. Um, but we can note that these times of sale and the aftermath of accidents are key points of vulnerability to refineries, times that we can um, utilize um, our, our force as NGOs and concerned community members in order to assist and argue for a just transition away from these existing petrochemical regimes. So we have to look for these opportunities. When sales happen, we need to advocate that governments use the opportunity to review and limit operations of refineries when that ownership changes. Likewise, in the aftermath of accidents, we should advocate for governments to better protect workers and communities while setting up for a just transition in the aftermath of these refineries, which we know will come eventually. It's more a matter of when than if. And so we plan for the transition. Transitioning away from petrochemical infrastructure is difficult, but it's possible. We see ongoing evidence of that in Philadelphia, and we look forward uh, with great um, expectation to uh, the experiences that we can learn from, from them setting up workers and communities to thrive in the aftermath of refining regimes. And I pass it off to Lauren. Yeah, so um, to find off ramps for Washington's oil refineries, the key implications for transitioning lie largely within two key points. The first being the current uses for the oil refined in Washington, such as where it's transported and how it's used in the state. And the second being the current jobs provided within Washington's refineries and those employed. And that transition away from oil refineries will have to consider equitable job transitions for these employees. Oil refined in Washington is used both in state and out of state with 90% of oil used in Washington and Oregon coming from these five refineries in state and the remaining 10% of our oil coming from other Western states. 
89% of oil within Washington is refined by these in-state refineries. 15% of oil is exported to California, Alaska, British Columbia, and other countries along the Pacific Rim. According to an article by the Sightline Institute, because of this distribution, it would not be beneficial to simply reduce oil reliance within Washington as shutting down and replacing Washington oil refineries is crucial as these refineries might just fill demands and export oil elsewhere. This organization has also touched on the fact that, quote, the solution to achieving our climate goals is simple, starting in our own backyard, reducing regional petroleum supply by retiring the refineries in accordance with reductions in regional demand for oil, end quote. So this section of the presentation will focus on what Washington can do to replace oil. <clears throat> Another aspect of how oil refined by Washington's five refineries is used is how this oil is used within our state. According to US Energy Information and Administration, this can be broken down into four main categories, with tra the transportation sector accounting for four-fifths of oil consumed in the state, the industrial sector making up one-sixth of Washington's oil consumption, the commercial sector accounting for 2%, and the residential ac sector accounting for less than 2%. So the, trans the transportation sector makes up the vast majority of oil use in the state, and this will be the focal point for our tr transition away from this. Because oil refined and used in Washington is largely used for transportation, other forms of fuel to fill the demand um, away from oil also include or also exist. Some possibilities to shift away from oil use and transportation may include increased renewable energy for electric transit, improved public transportation, and improved pub or, uh, pedestrian infrastructure to encourage walking and biking transportation. A recently improved transportation legislation for Washington called Move Ahead Wa outlines funding for many of these areas that would also help the dependence of transportation on oil. This funding for legislation includes funding for our carbon reduction and multimodal expansion, improved transit, funding to fix existing infrastructure, and for walking and biking projects in historically underfunded communities. Each of these initiatives would greatly decrease the need for oil in Washington transportation. A shift away from the use of oil in Washington as we retire the five oil refineries in the state will require new forms of fuel to replace the needs of oil currently that are the needs that oil is currently filling in our state. As the transportation sector in Washington consumes the majority of oil in the state, the sector will require new forms of fuel or electricity to continue fueling our state's transportation. For a green shift away from oil, renewable energy should be used to produce electricity for transportation. Hydroelectricity accounts for 66% of Washington's current electricity generation and expansion of these sources could potentially be a solution. However, Implementation of a greater variety of renewable energy sources is likely the most feasible option in order to divert type, in order to diversify and expand the reliability of our electricity, basing this on surrounding environments rather than relying on one single source. One possibility for transitioning and setting, shutting down oil refineries is to use the current infrastructure to transition to new forms of energy to fuel our demand. Oil, oil refineries have the available equipment, technical knowledge, and experience to potentially produce clean fuel alternatives which could include these existing systems to produce green hydrogen. And additionally, numerous refineries in the US have already pursued retrofits to enable production of renewable diesel or sustainable aviation fuels. Shifting to integrated fire refineries may allow us to produce a range of bioproducts as well. But this raises a big question and this question can be posed to um, the whole group if anyone has any thoughts on it, which is will shifting to the production of bioproducts retain adverse effects on the communities and environments surrounding refineries? If anyone has any input on that question. I'm wondering about, so like some uh, news has come out about Elon Musk's factories and how like, okay, cool, you're making electric cars, but factories are not using sustainable methods to produce the cars. So I'm wondering if something like that might happen here where it seems like they're doing something good, but then, yeah. It's not actually done in a sustainable way. Right. And I think that's kind of a big issue with like um, electric cars and things because a lot of the production still requires if it's not produced in a state that uses a lot of renewable energy, right. the production still uses fossil fuels and it's right. still resource intensive. And it um, it's not the same as like green public transportation, for instance, which would like increase the amount of like availability to all people and decrease the amount of cars and uh, new infrastructure we're building. But yeah, that's a great point. I. I'm definitely interested in looking more into how um, those kind of initiatives fold out and how we can hopefully look more towards public transit rather than like 
uh, just increasing infrastructure and um, electric cars. I really want a new electric car. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, like, I'm also wondering how can we make transit sexy? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. how are we going to write the story around it to make it attractive and exciting? Right. Like, um, really available and accessible to everyone and make it like the um, benefits way out over like individual cars potentially. Yeah. I also think part of it has to do with selling people on the idea of how yeah. much you, you need to do in order to reduce those uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, so with electric cars, most states use fossil fuels to produce their electricity. In Washington, it's, in Washington, it's much better. It's still somewhat problematic just because we use hydroelectric power uh, primarily, um, but it's definitely better. And so I think part of that involves getting people to, uh, to be really involved in the fight against fossil fuel uh, consumption and more uh, renewable sources. I think another thing with transportation is convenience. Um, a lot of people like having their own car because it's very convenient. But in the cities, the traffic's like once everyone got their own car, it started being taking longer, especially like at rush hour. Yeah. You move like one mile in an hour. Yeah. That's no longer convenient. Um, rather, if because we could either continue doing it that way and shift to electric vehicles, but with public transportation, if we just kind of improve that sector instead, we could have more efficient timing um, and more people could use it, more accessible, um, and also better for the environment. Um, and then also on your other point, uh, some of the refineries that the U.S. has pursued um, to do retrofits have been using clean electricity to to produce those bioproducts. So that would be ideal. Um, although it's hard to kind of hold these companies accountable. So that's definitely something that would need to be taken into consideration, but it's it's possible to be done with clean energy all around. Yeah. yeah. Uh, public biofuels, uh, I would uh, just bring up the idea of land use change, which is basically of some agricultural Use of agricultural land for soil production or or um, so that's that's one way of increasing the carbon intensity of fuels to be aware. Yeah, definitely. I know there's a lot of this is definitely just one or one option, not a like complete solution because there's a lot of like negative impacts of biofuels and like you were saying, the agricultural impacts and how we are already don't have enough land to produce the amount of food we need to feed. Um, like our state, it's important to like not degrade that system, I guess. So my final point um, to consider is the need for equitable job transition within oil refineries as we shut the refineries down. To feasibly shut down or replace oil refineries, the employment of the workers at the refineries must be considered and not disregarded. A possible option for the shift in employment in line with ideas of expanding Washington's renewable energy sector would be to provide jobs that align with current positions of employees to work within the sector. And I'll pass it on to Tia. All right, so kind of to conclude our presentation here, um, I wanted to go over some next steps for everyone to be taking. Um, so as a community member, it's very important to show up and show out. Do your, do your best to let your voice be heard. That can be challenging and also kind of disheartening to hear when you try so hard and it's, a hard thing to do. So that's kind of why we need to all work together on this. Um, but as was stated, the Tacoma resident uh, call out was very impactful. Just remember that people have power together when we work together. Um, and so that's kind of moving towards that um, NGOs and organizations such as for the people. Um, and a lot of those other organizations and representatives that are here working together will be key because I think like what we have found is we have in this presentation compiled a lot of different research from a lot of different organizations and people working towards this issue. When we all come together, we can come up with a lot of cool solutions. Um, yep. And it's a just a, it's a, also a place where we can listen to diverse perspectives and kind of hear everybody's side of the story because that's very important. Like considering job transitions. Um, 
which kind of goes into the just transition, providing employment opportunities. A lot of the people who are currently working at oil refineries, we've I've done a bit of research and several people have said it's not necessarily like money and prioritizing healthcare, uh, purchasing medication, food, housing is going to be prioritized over their moral values of where they're going to work because you can't prioritize those values when you don't have food on the table for you and your family. So that's going to be really important um, for just transition. And then uh, leadership. So Washington, and this kind of relates to policy as well. This is more of like a government um, type next step. So Washington has a responsibility as a global, global leader in the climate crisis. In the United States right now, Washington has been um, a leader in the climate crisis, even though uh, not to the extent at which many of us would like to see. Um, but we need to continue um, doing that. Um, especially with the United States being one of the largest polluters or uh, contributors to climate change, it's going to be very important. Um, so pushing that on to policy, we're going to need to pressure our pol politicians um, as much as we can. As we have seen throughout the presentation, a lot of work has been done when policy has been implemented. Um, that's one of the best ways that we can regulate this uh, industry. So that will that could be, come from environmental policy. Um, that could be protecting certain environments, um, conserving biodiversity, pollution, um, economic policy. That could be um, implementing carbon taxes or taxes on oil refineries, subsidies for clean energy to incentivize change, um, investments from the government into renewables and clean energy so that those companies have the power to take over the oil industry, kind of. Um, and then justice. Lastly, justice. This ties into pretty much everything that we've gone over because climate justice is like racial justice. It is justice for everyone because we have the right to clean air, to clean water, to clean environment. Um, and we need to ensure that future solutions are just. So that relates to the just transition, providing employment opportunities, and making sure that our new solutions don't continue to have um, disproportionate effects on communities. For example, with the biofuels, if we're going to pursue that, we need to make sure that these agricultural uh, like actions that are being taken to produce those bioproducts don't just continue to disproportionately affect marginalized communities because we're not necessarily moving forward um, if our solutions continue to have the same adverse effects. Um, so what can we do? This is more of kind of like on an individual level. Um, so individually transition away from fossil fuels where you can, um, if that's, and once again, that's kind of a hard thing and kind of you need the money to do it. So aside from that, we can sign petitions, donate to organizations such as For the People, or, um, and then pressure your politicians, as stated before. Um, sometimes it's, yeah, just people have power, um, even though sometimes it feels like we don't. There's been <laughs> many um, examples within these slides of where people working together can definitely make change. Um, and then educate yourselves and others. So coming to talks like this, going to events, doing your own research, and then spreading the word to those that you know, those in your community to help make this movement stronger. Um, and also like sharing it with people who are possibly involved in the oil industry and how they can shift away from that. So for our final discussion question, uh, we would like to ask what you guys are planning to do to fight um, oil industries and how we can help you make that change. So if you want to throw that in the chat, you could speak out. Um, in person here, we have some sticky notes that I can pass out um, so that we can see what everyone's planning on doing. There's a comment from the previous question, if you have to read that. Oh, yeah. All right, so 
Our comment on the previous question was good point on food implications. The U.S. and the EU biofuels policies in response to Middle East dependencies and in the EU climate change has disastrous impacts of world food security. Ironically, growing biofuels usually happens through industrial agriculture, which is completely tied to petroleum. That's very true. And once again, like a lot of our solutions are still tied to precedent, um, which happens to be oil. So it's going to take a diverse range of perspectives, people's disciplinaries, to really cover this fully. And once again, just like prioritizing justice will be key. Well, I already uh, take public transport pretty often to get to work, but I definitely think the, the spot where I could definitely fix, and again, this is partially of Washington. Uh, Washington's better about this than most states, but energy consumption is a bit of an issue for me. I'm just somebody who, uh, leaves lights on. Sometimes I fall asleep with the lights on, and so that's uh, something to fix for a couple of different reasons, but also <laughs> an energy. Like continuing to like take classes while I'm in college on these issues, and um, continue to educate myself and tell those around me about like um, what I'm learning, and that so far for me has been really important to like having. A Great understanding of all these like huge issues and how I can potentially further clear like um, help to like fight for those issues. I carpool uh, when I go home for weekends. So if I uh, I'm going sorry if I'm going home for a weekend, I I tend to do so only to carpool with friends who are also planning to go home. That way we make one trip instead of seventeen trips to the same place. Um. Energy use, though, is also something that I need to work on. I always seem to forget to turn off my computer when I'm done with it. That's a big energy user right there. Yeah, that's it for me. Uh, you know, I mainly stay, <clears throat> you know, around the area that I live in. Um, I mean, obviously, my second home is in Tacoma, so I do drive down there whenever I go home, you know, once a month or however long. But, um, <clears throat> When I go to, you know, leave the area, go to downtown Seattle or whatever, uh, more light rail use or, you know, public transportation, um, I can probably take more advantage of that. Um, but me as a graduating senior, I won't have the opportunity to take any more classes like this, but I'd like to, you know, stay educated, um, you know, be able to attend or participate in events like this, as well as just do my own research and stay updated with, you know, environmental news. Mm -hmm. And also, I'd like to point out, just going over this slide, although individual action is very important, we don't want to shift away from the fact that the majority of our emissions are coming from these big corporations. It's Our individual efforts do make a difference, but the main thing that we need to do is pressure these big corporations and our politicians to make change. Just, yeah, reiterating. Yes. I think another piece of it too, on, as well as the pressure, is also educating. Mm -hmm. um, because I think a lot of pol politicians are actually uneducated sometimes on um, uh, perspectives that are important to understand why environmental uh, justice is important, I guess. Um, yeah, so in my work, I, I do community organizing work. Um, a variety of different levels, like uh, municipal, regional, and statewide, and some national, I suppose. Um, and so I think for me, what I can commit to is continuing to build and nurture networks that can sustain education for environmental justice. There's a comment in the chat. I just want to acknowledge there is one of the official activities that might be involved. So thanks to the participants who have Oh, yes, thank you. Um, so we have a comment from David. He said, or they said, I will continue to lobby our state legislature to improve state regulation of polluters, including the refineries. In the last session, we passed improved insurance requirements for oil transport by vessel. 
That is awesome. Thank you for your work. Um, and is it Grace? Do you mind if I read? Okay. Grace said, um, um, they're going to continue to empower youth, push for uh, CO2-based heat pumps, um, and donate to smaller activist organizations which have a greater impact on greenhouse gas emissions than larger organizations. Yeah, so definitely, yeah, reiterating that a lot of the times, like the small communities that are being affected the most can, a lot of the smaller organizations that focus on communities that are really impacted can be super impactful. <laughs> All right, so we have another comment from uh, Julie. Uh, Julia, uh, one cool act of civil disobedience that I'm aware of here in Anacortes is that the Coast Salish canoe paddlers to write under the refineries, oh, go right under the refineries, big piers every year during their canoe gathering. The refineries call the cops on them every year, but what are the cops going to do about 50 canoes paddling away? <laughs> the refineries act like they don't own the whole bay. Oh, like they do own the whole bay, but they don't. That's awesome, Julia. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming and special thanks to Derek um, and everyone else who helped us put this presentation together. Um, thank you.